All right, and, and uh, our next and last speaker for this session is, again, Mr. Shantanu Sarkar from Plantronics, and I would like to re-invite him back to the stage, please. Well, good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Well, all right, sounds good. Um, here to talk about wearables. A couple of quick questions. Who here has heard of or seen Google Glass? Everyone, I assume. Same thing about an Apple iWatch. I just should turn it the other way around. Who hasn't heard of an app, the rumored Apple iWatch? Yeah. Then there is the Nike Fed, the Jawbone up, and so on and so forth. Seems like no matter where you go, there is this new wearable, either health fitness or some new device that's supposed to come around. So it's wearables. So every time you keep saying, you look at the analyst reports, wearables are supposed to explode, and so on and so forth. Well, the question I was thinking of is, fine, the wearables will come here. Now what? What's next? Now that we all know wearables are going to explode and so on and so forth. So went back a little bit saying, we've seen this movie before. Now, every once in a while, there comes, we've seen the future. It's going to change. So let me take you back a little bit in time for some of us uh, that kind of their age. But uh, think 1980. We've seen the future, it's PCs. Dramatic change from mainframes and mini computers to PCs. People started putting apps in, putting uh, cards in, modifying their PCs, got computing power in their hands instead of a terminal to shared computing. Right? Things change dramatically. So it was a fairly disruptive change in the way things used to be done. So that was 1980. Fast forward a little bit, 2005. We've seen the future, and it's smartphones. You know, used to have uh, feature phones earlier. A reasonable estimate that if I look around the room, there probably are zero feature phones out there right now. Everybody's got a smartphone. Right? Um, uh, Jeff was talking about mobile first for this new app. Well, because everybody's got a smartphone. Eight years ago, guys. Significant disruptive change. Now, when it comes to 2013, well, it's wearables. Another significant disruptive change. And yes, there is a headset on top for those of you who are actually paying attention. Uh, I'll come back to that. The other ones I talked about, the Google Glass and uh, the Samsung Galaxy Gear. By the way, did you folks see the I think it was last week, Samsung had a five full pages of ads in the New York Times about the Galaxy Gear and the Samsung Note. Kind of interesting, covered all of that. So question is, now that we've, it isn't the first time there's been a disruptive change. It's been there before. What have we learned? Now, as we think about wearables, as we think about building them, what have we learned from the last two times this happened that we can take into this new set of devices. Thing one, wall gardens. Anybody remember the mainframe world of wall gardens? Can't do anything. You're pretty much stuck. And yeah, and the PCs, the Mac world tends to be a little bit of a wall garden as well. Uh, and then you're thinking of feature phones. Used to be a locked system, completely closed down. You could do very little innovation in that. So if there's one lesson to learn from those changes, what succeeds? No walled gardens. An open ecosystem, right? If you're not building an open ecosystem, you're completely dependent on what one company can do. iPhone, how many apps are there on the iPhone or Android? Probably half a million today. Well, how many of them did Apple or Google build? Very tiny fraction. So what made those products really, really successful was the ability to harness the creativity of a whole bunch of people. So if you think wearables, what's going to make wearables successful? Well, the ability to harness the creativity of a whole bunch of people. How do you do that? With an open ecosystem. So thing one to take away from the past is wearables need to be about an open ecosystem. Think about the last word for that, a system. Now, if you look at history, the two things to always look at is 
Why is this similar? Why is this different? It's similar? Yeah, no walled gardens. Why is it different? As things shrink, what becomes hard? Battery life, physical size, computing power. What do we expect from our, um, you know, our wearables, let's say? Well, see, you want 10 hours of battery life, you want it to be this small, you want it to be fashionable, you want it to be light. Doesn't say much for CPU power, does it, if you have to make it that small and have really, really long battery life. How do you do that? So you don't build standalone devices. So if you look at what we expect wearables to do, thing one is mobility. It's got to work wherever you are. How does it do it? I mean, we've already seen multiple approaches to it. Google versus Samsung. Google put connectivity directly into Google Glass. Samsung connected it through the smartphone. Tightly coupled. Same goal, two ways of achieving it. The second part, what's the screen size on a Nike Fit? About an inch by a third of an inch. What's the screen size on your PC? This big, or even if you've got a laptop. What's the screen size on your smartphone? Four inches, diagonal. What's happening? The ability to display stuff is rapidly shrinking as you move into wearables. What does that mean? I cannot say, you have 100 emails. Email one through 100, please scroll down to walk through it. Can you do that on a wearable? Uh, you'd return it the next day, saying this is completely unusable. Same thing on a PC, just works. We've been doing that all day. What makes it possible to coherently display information on a screen that's about this big? You summarize, you analyze, so also known as big data. You look at all the data, you figure out what's important. I do not want to know I have 100 emails. I want to know about the one email that I would consider important. I want to be notified of that. How do you know which of my 300 emails, if I use Kafir's numbers, is important? Analyze. Look at what I respond to. Why do I respond to that? Without analytics, you cannot build a wearable device because you do not have the luxury of showing tons of data. Analytics are one part. How do you get that much horsepower? I mean, this thing is about, you know, it's smaller than my watch, and I have a relatively large watch. I'm not going to get CPU in there to run analytics. So if you follow that through, you need to be cloud connected because that's the only way you can get enough horsepower to be able to run analytics to present data in a wearable form factor. And yes, I know there are three quadrants, the fourth is missing. Go put that in. See, at Plantronics, we've been building wearables for 50 years, in a way. Headsets are wearables. Used to be just audio devices. We've increasingly enhanced it with sensors and uh, you know, adding it to a cloud backend and so on and so forth. So we've learned a few things out of the way. Now, I'm not going to do a product pitch for headsets here. But we've encountered a lot of the issues that you get. And as we transition to building wearables and as we look at the larger picture of wearables, there are a bunch of things we've learned. This is part of it, saying one is you build an open ecosystem. The second is you build a system. You do not build a device, you build a system. And the system goes all the way from what you wear on you to a cloud backend and a way of connecting the two. So you can run analytics on that and so on. The other part, it isn't just a wearable and cloud system. Think about sensors. Keith talked briefly about it and was saying using contextual information and uh, sensors to better shape collaboration and so on and so forth. Sensors are everywhere, and the wearables with the sensors and the data in them do not exist in isolation. You're tying into computing all around you, you're tying into sensors all around you. I mean, imagine if this room was full. Now, you'd have temperature sensors, you'd know people are coming in, so it's time to crank up the air conditioning. Yeah, you need to have a room sensor as well. You can't just be everybody's wearables, even if you aggregate them together. So, if you are, wearables have to provide a purpose. I mean, it's great to have a pedometer that measures steps, 
But to be truly effective, they need to change the way we live our lives, make it easier, make it easier, make it better, and so on. So the new normal becomes a set of sensors, contextual gatherers, rather. I'm saying contextual gatherers because it's not always a physical sensor. You could be looking at audio, analyzing it. You could be looking at ambient noise. You could be measuring physical sensors. Take all of this, put it together. So for example, I was briefly talking about uh, providing the best collaboration experience. So I'm walking down, uh, say, in my office. I get a phone call. System figures out it's an important phone call. Or this could be a video call. Yeah, fine, except I have my cell phone and nothing else with me. But there's a video conference room that's available. You've all heard this in one form or another. Video conference room that's available nearby, transfer the call out there, book me, send me a message saying walk over to this room, your conference is waiting. All of that is doable, but it requires a certain degree of interaction between the sensors in me, information available, the rooms available, booking the room, calendar invites, my physical location inside the building, which is not just a GPS location, so it needs sensors inside the building or location beacons and so on and so forth to put it all together. So it's a system of sensors, some of which are wearable, as well as notification that constitutes wearables. It's not a device by itself. It's not even a system by itself. There are several aspects to it. Now let's look at where it would be useful. Now, it's tempting to say there's going to be one wearable that is going to rule it all and be all things to all people. Reality is probably that it's going to focus on verticals because that's where it's easier to design a system simply because there's a limited number of use cases that provide value. And most of the ones we've seen so far are on the fitness and wellness area, right? Because it's relatively simple, it's a smaller ecosystem, you can build that and get that and provide value. And they've been catching on. Next one, healthcare and medical, patient monitoring. Um, notifications, we've all been hearing about healthcare costs, at least in the US, healthcare costs going up and so on and so forth. Well, what's a big reason for that going up? It's instead of preventive care, you end up having emergency care. That change alone, to be able to monitor patient conditions, react to it in time, instead of a trip to the emergency room, huge savings. That alone is worth deploying wearables for every patient who needs it. Now, yes, that means it has to be it has to have compliance, it has to have security, patient privacy, and so on and so forth. In the business or office, how do you improve workflows? We talked a little bit about, well, if I'm close to my PC, how do I, I can share a document. If I'm not, I can't. That's just a small example, but there are cases around security, around sharing, collaboration, communications in general, specific things for infotainment. I'll give you an example, head tracking. If you're looking around, the system can sense where you're looking, right? Now imagine you're playing a video game. And by the way, I'm really bad at joysticks. I can handle iPad games, I'm not really good at joystick games because you're moving your two thumbs in opposite directions. What happens? Well, I move this joystick, it pulls, and the other ones to shoot. Not a very user-friendly way of doing things. But imagine I move my head and the whole view changes. Much more intuitive way of playing a video game. So imagine sensors, now, Microsoft Connect is another way of doing it, but it's by looking at the input from the camera and modifying the video game. The other way of achieving that, probably with more accuracy and granularity and easier to do in some respects, is just put sensors on you or around you. So specific verticals are where the value is. Let me go into, I call this the, the summary slide of everything we've learned trying to build wearables for 50 years, combined into one slide. Sort of. So thing one, need to have sensors. The sheer volume of information coming to us, as well as the constraints of, no, think of wearables as invisible computing, if you will. Now we've all heard about ubiquitous computing and invisible computing. How do you make it small so it's nearly invisible? And how do you make it smart? So 
It sends you the key information you need, not everything, not the huge dump of 300 emails and you know, 20 Facebook, not 20, more like 50 Facebook updates and so on and so forth. So sensors are key, apps are key. No matter how good you are, if you try and build the whole thing yourself, it doesn't happen. There need to be pluggable components as apps. We've seen that with PCs. We saw that with smartphones. We're seeing that again. This may be app directly running in the wearables. More likely, it's an app tying into the wearable system. It's about privacy. So talked about a whole bunch of data coming out, whether it's patient information, it's where you are, it's what you're doing, it's what you're looking at. How about privacy controls and all that data? Who gets it? Do you control all of it? Do you have uh, you know, the hospital control it? Is it freely available? What are controls around it? How do you make sure it's there? Power consumption, because remember, wearables are all about, I want 24 hour battery life out of this thing, even though it's about this small. Interoperability. The moment you say open ecosystem, what are the words that come to mind? I'm, we've kind of been there with you know, MTC, with 323 and so on, and SIP and so on. Interfaces, standards, interoperability, certification, verification. So those things automatically come into place as you think open ecosystem. A lot of that is required. This is about you know, at least five years worth of work going forward to make all of these pieces happen. Development platforms, if you need apps, you have to build development platforms. Ergonomics, because you're on the body, really critical to have ergonomics, and connectivity. And finally, of course, smaller is better in this case. So this wasn't a specific pitch. I wanted to outline some of the key areas and, uh, that we have to do in wearables going forward. This is an answer to the now what question. There's some things we can learn from the past saying, I don't know, this is another turn of the wheel, another disruptive product. It is disruptive, it is exploding. So the key is to understand what can we directly borrow from previous ones, what are new things we have to learn. That's pretty much all I had. Questions? Okay. In that case, thank you for your time.